And up next, as I stated a few moments ago, in the killing contest with Camilla and Jill, please take it away and enjoy. Welcome to our session on Ending Wildlife Killing Contests in the U.S. My name is Jill Fritz and I'm a Director of Wildlife Protection at the Humane Society of the United States. Today I'll be joined by my colleague Camilla Fox, Founder and Executive Director of Project Coyote. Today we'll give you an overview of wildlife killing contests, the history, recent achievements, and our plans to end these cruel events nationwide in the coming years. Then we'll discuss the formation in 2018 of the National Coalition to End Wildlife Killing Contests and the campaign that's taken the nation by storm. First, please be advised though that there will be some graphic and disturbing images and video in this presentation. So first a quick overview. Uh, across the US, thousands of wild animals are slaughtered in wildlife killing contests every year. In these gruesome events, participants compete to kill wildlife species like coyotes, foxes, bobcats, and others over a specified time period for cash and prizes. They may be judged by how many animals are killed or by the heaviest animal, or there may be categories for the quote, biggest dog or littlest dog, meaning coyotes, or by a point system like 10 points per bobcat five points per coyote, three points per fox, and so on. Hundreds of animals may be killed during a single contest, which usually takes place over one or two days. The senseless waste of wildlife that occurs during these events is unimaginable. This has nothing to do with hunting for food or subsistence. It's simply a blood sport. To help paint a picture of what these animals face, we're going to start by showing you footage of an undercover investigation by the HSUS that was conducted recently in upstate New York. Again, please be advised that there will be graphic imagery. Mm -hmm. the first documented wildlife killing contest took place, organized by ranchers in Chandler, Arizona. Their objective was to try to exterminate coyotes that they claim were a threat to their livestock animals. These contests then started to spread across western U.S. states, most often targeting coyotes. Then they moved eastwards. Other targeted animals include bobcats, foxes, prairie dogs, rabbits, woodchucks, raccoons, rattlesnakes, squirrels, skunks, even wolves and cougars in some cases. 
We know of at least a thousand wildlife killing contests that have been held in the US just since 2014. And they're held in almost all of the 43 states that have not yet banned them. These are just some examples of contests that target coyotes, foxes, bobcats, crows, squirrels, and more in states all over the US. And to add another disturbing layer to these events, often they're hosted or sponsored by important institutions in our society that are supposed to influence our values or reflect our beliefs, like 4-H clubs, farm bureaus, fire departments, middle and senior high schools, and even churches, as well as social organizations like the American Legion and the VFW, Chambers of Commerce, and Convention and Visitors Bureaus, and of course, sponsors also include many local bars and restaurants and hardware stores, in addition to major companies like Nikon, which also manufactures rifle scopes and other equipment. Most often the prizes for these contests are the cash pot from the entrance fees, but prizes or raffles also include the calling devices used to lure out the animals, rifle scopes, spotlights, and other equipment often donated by manufacturers who sponsor many of these contests. And as you can see, even AR-15 rifles are awarded as prizes or as raffle giveaways. And there are nationwide contests too, like the Great Predator Showdown and uh, the American Predator Challenge and the North American Coyote Classic where people can download apps to uh, log the kills or even the videos of their kills uh, and check in for um, cash and prizes. But while participants thrive on the thrill of the kill, uh, cash and prizes are the big draw. And many of these contests are high stakes. For example, more than $350,000 in prize money was doled out at the 2020 West Texas Big Bobcat Contest. In the January leg of the event, a two-man team killed 94 gray foxes in less than 24 hours. This photo was taken at their 2014 event where you can see 53 gray foxes. The winner of the 2020 contest killed almost double the number you see here. So you might ask, how can two people kill 94 animals in less than 24 hours? Participants often use unsporting practices like baiting with food and electronic calling devices that mimic the sounds of young animals in distress to lure them in for an easy kill. And you also can't discount cheating. As you saw, our undercover investigators have been told by participants that it happens. So why is, are these cruel events still legal in 43 states? Well, coyotes and other fur-bearing non-game animals, as in those that are not killed by hunters to eat, have long been considered pests with few of any restrictions on their killing. In the past, bounties were offered in which participants turned in the ears of coyotes for money. In fact, Utah still offers a bounty of $50 per coyote. And South Dakota is continuing its horrific nest predator bounty program this year by offering $5 for each tail of a red fox, raccoon, opossum, badger, or skunk that is killed. And that resulted in the death of more than 50,000 of those animals in South Dakota last year. And tasked by Congress with, quote, animal damage control, uh, the federal USDA Wildlife Services program started killing as many coyotes as possible in 1931 and currently uses aerial gunning and poisons to kill tens of thousands each year. Roughly 50,000 coyotes are killed by individual and local, state, and federal government agencies every year, about one per minute. So while this mass killing of animals has persisted for decades, largely unseen by the general public, in recent years, this murky world has come to light. In 2014, an investigative piece in the publication Vice exposed the true nature of killing contests, that they are not, in fact, motivated by wildlife management concerns, but rather by hatred and greed. Participants in the Idaho Coyote and Wolf Derby described in graphic detail that their intent was not just to kill the wolves and the coyotes, 
but to inflict grievous damage on their bodies and prolong their suffering as much as possible. No one reading this harrowing expose could come away with the impression that killing contests have anything to do with sportsmanship, responsible hunting, or conservation. It's simply reveling in the joy of killing for the chance at cash prizes. So as you saw in the video earlier, the HSUS has released the results of several undercover investigations of contests in Oregon, Maryland, New Jersey, and New York State. And in 2018, a cover story in our All Animals magazine galvanized the public with the account of its author, HSUS writer Karen Lang, visiting the check-in of a killing contest in Montana. And we've created a free toolkit at humanesociety.org slash killing contest toolkit. Please note the contest is plural on that. And there you'll find tips and templates to help you work on policy at the state level, contact organizers to ask them to cancel their events, and sponsors to ask them to no longer support them. And you'll find out how to do research, organize efforts in your state, and details on the current laws and regulations that ban killing contests. And even sample testimony and tips on how to deliver it to legislative committees and wildlife commissions. So as you can see, dedicated advocates, concerned citizens, and wildlife protection organizations across the country are determined to end these wildlife killing contests once and for all. And they're winning some major victories. So now I'll turn it over to Camilla Fox of Project Coyote, who will discuss how we're ex we've exposed these events in recent years, the work of her organization to end wildlife killing contests, and the formation of a national coalition. Thank you, Jill, and great to be with you all today. Just to share a little bit about Project Coyote, I founded the organization in 2008, and our mission is very simple, to promote compassionate conservation and coexistence between people and wildlife through education, science, and advocacy. And we advocate on behalf of the most maligned, misunderstood, and persecuted wild carnivores of North America, from coyotes and bobcats to bears, mountain lions, and wolves. We work to change the laws and policies at the state, federal, and local levels to protect animals from cruelty and abuse, and to advocate on their behalf by promoting effective solutions that foster compassionate coexistence. A core campaign for Project Coyote is ending wildlife killing contests. And just to provide a little bit of background about how we came to learn about this practice, in 2012, we learned about a very large coyote killing contest known as Coyote Drive in Northern California in Modoc County. So we looked into this and learned that this killing contest actually expanded into four counties. And at the time, this is where OR7, also known as Journey, the one lone gray wolf was traversing the landscape, looking for a mate, looking for um, territory. And so the more that we looked into this and recognized that this was not unique to Northern California, that in fact these killing contests were happening all over the state, we decided to petition our state agency, our California Fish and Game Commission. We argued not only was this one lone gray wolf in danger of being killed by coyote hunters, as we know from other states that dispersing wolves are frequently killed by coyote hunters, we also argued that <clears throat> ultimately our state should ban these killing contests because they're ecologically reckless, they're ethically indefensible, and that they really contravene sound wildlife conservation and stewardship. As we waged a grassroots campaign across the state, our opposition became very apparent with Big Ag and the sport hunting lobby in full force at all of the commission meetings. They sent highly paid lobbyists to each meeting to vocally oppose the proposed ban on killing contests. And they basically argued that killing contests are necessary to protect livestock, that they're effective at reducing predator populations and boosting ungulate populations like deer and elk that hunters target for game. The commission ultimately asked us to respond to these claims by the killing contest proponents. <clears throat> and we did so in a scientific opinion letter that was buttressed and is buttressed by peer reviewed literature now it's signed by more than 70 conservation scientists from across North America. We've since repurposed this letter and in each of the states where we have successfully banned killing contests, we often pull in prominent scientists within the state in which we're campaigning. 
Through our youth education and outreach program called Keeping It Wild, we've involved young people in the fight to ban killing contests. They've testified at commission meetings, wrote compelling letters, and created beautiful art in support of the proposed bans. We had hundreds of volunteers who showed up to testify at meetings across the state, many of whom traveled far distances on their own dime to make their voices heard, which was in sharp contrast to the highly paid lobbyists who represented killing contest proponents. Finally, after a very intense and long 18 month grassroots campaign, the California Fish and Game Commission voted in, 20, in December 2014 to ban this practice. And ultimately it was banning the prizes and other inducements for killing both fur bearing and non-game animals in the state. This includes coyotes, foxes, raccoons, and a whole host of species. Ultimately, this decision made California the first to enact a ban on killing contests statewide. And as we campaigned in California, we researched the prevalence of killing contests in other states and realized that this was a huge and growing problem across the nation. We also recognized that our greatest challenge was a lack of public awareness. We found most policymakers were completely unaware that killing contests were happening or even often that they're legal in their states. So recognizing the power of documentary films, we produced a uh, short documentary about this practice, both to raise public awareness and also to inspire action to end the practice. We're gonna share a short clip and as uh, Jill had shared with the investigations, there's also some graphic imagery in this. Few Americans have ever heard of a practice called wildlife killing contests. This is a practice where predators, particularly coyotes, bobcats, foxes, even wolves are targeted. The person who kills the most is awarded a gun, a belt buckle, a ribbon. So we're depleting the ecosystem of all the components that lead to a healthy ecosystem and a healthier environment for us to live in. If we have to exterminate all the native species to ranch, then we probably shouldn't be ranching. We have an idea of the integrity of nature. We ask people to be mindful of the relationship between humans and wild animals. Both have a job to do. We're going to lose these beautiful animals, animals that have just as much right to be here as we do. Working with local advocates and our national coalition, we have uh, shown this film across the country. Um, we've focused in areas like New Mexico, Arizona, Massachusetts, and Colorado in advance of pushing for state bans, and we've done multi-city blitzes. It's been really wonderful because we've generally had local organizations be part of this, national organizations, and at each film screening we have one call to action and that is to contact your policymakers and urge them to enact a ban. To date, Wildlife in the Crosshairs has been shown across the country, making its way through the film festival circuit, winning multiple awards along the way, and really providing an invaluable tool in our growing campaign to end this unconscionable practice. And because of the publicity from the work of many amazing advocates working on statewide bans, the release of Killing Games, and the HSUS investigation videos, the media began to take notice in a very significant way. In 2017, the Chicago Tribune's editorial board condemned killing contests after HSUS Illinois State Director Mark Ayers took photos at one of the events. Days later, the New York Times published an article about the squirrel slam in upstate New York and outlets from across the country have covered the issue, spurring significant public outrage and action against killing contests. <clears throat> then in late 2018, I was interviewed for the landmark Mountain Journal article, A Death of Ex Ethics is Hunting Destroying Itself. The article exposed the gruesome reality of not only killing contests, but also the important practice of coyote whacking in which snowmobile riders filmed themselves gleefully chasing down and running over coyotes. Perhaps most surprising about this article was the response of hunters themselves to these activities. For example, Mike Finley, former chair of the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, referred to killing contests as slaughter fests, 
and stomach turning examples of wanton waste and went on to express concern that these contests were tainting the image of hunting overall. And that's a concern echoed by state wildlife commissions and agencies in Vermont, Arizona, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Washington in the past three years before all those states ban them altogether. As you can see, each of these statements is remarkably sim similar and shows growing opposition to killing contests, not only from the public and advocates, but from responsible hunters and wildlife management professionals. By banning the senseless slaughter of wildlife, management agencies are upholding their duty under the public trust doctrine to protect and maintain wildlife for current and future generations. Agencies are increasingly recognizing that the vast majority of citizens will no longer tolerate the killing of wildlife as part of a contest, tournament, or derby. In 2018, Project Coyote and the Humane Society of the Knights co-founded the National Coalition to End Wildlife Killing Contests. We're very proud to share that we now have more than 50 state and national organizations that are part of this coalition. And our mission is very sim simple. It's to end this practice nationwide. Coalition members engage their supporters in states considering ban on, bans on killing contests, while also keeping our focus on big picture change at the national level. We engage national and regional wildlife management organizations to create policy statements or resolutions opposing killing contests. And we encourage professional and trade organizations not to sponsor or endorse these contests and to take a strong position opposing them. We also submit detailed science-based statements from the coalition on specific issues, such as asking the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to cancel its heinous statewide killing contest called the Georgia Coyote Challenge. This was essentially a state de facto, state-sponsored de facto killing contest. In 2019, we saw that the Georgia Department of Natural Resources had in fact discontinued this contest when its biologist told the Washington Post, a number of states have shown that government-sponsored programs to eradicate coyote populations are huge money pits that result in failure. Instead, he said the state has, quote, turned to educational programs to raise public awareness. This was only after tremendous pressure from wildlife advocates and scientists pressuring the agency to stop the state-sponsored Coyote Kill Fest. In 2016, the Pennsylvania Game Commission agreed, saying, quote, after decades of using predator control, such as paying bounties, with no effect in the emergence of wildlife management as a science, the agency finally accepted the reality that predator control does not work. They added, quote, the limiting factor is habitat. We must focus our ever efforts on habitat. This is how we can make a difference. And like the G Georgia DNR, many hunting groups have also made statements about how predator control is ineffective and pointless. HSUS has a full listing of those in their toolkit, <clears throat> but here are just a few examples from the Isaac Walton League, Ducks Unlimited, the National Wildlife Turkey Fe Federation, and the Mississippi Flyway Council, which manages migratory birds in that region. So you'll find on our uh, coalition website, which is projectcoyote.org back, backslash end killing contests, a whole host of uh, information, tools, resources, downloadable toolkits and fact sheets, and if you're part of or know of a wildlife focused group in your state that might like to join the coalition, they can apply right on the homepage of our coalition website. So now I will turn it over to Jill to talk about the progress that we as a coalition have made so far. Thanks, Camilla. Since 2014, seven US states have outlawed wildlife killing contests. After California, Vermont banned coyote killing contests through the state legislature in 2018. The following year, three states prohibited the event, New Mexico, followed by Arizona, and Massachusetts. Then in 2020, Colorado banned wildlife killing contests, and just a few months ago, Washington became the seventh state to outlaw killing contests. These victories were truly a team effort and could not have been done without our coalition partners, local advocates, and our volunteers and supporters. So here's the map so far. 
Sometimes killing contests were banned by state legislatures, which was the case in Vermont and New Mexico. And in other cases, they were banned by the state wildlife commissions, as happened in California, Arizona, Massachusetts, Colorado, and Washington State. And we're currently working on legislative bans in New Jersey, New York, New Hampshire, Maryland, and Oregon. And more states may soon be added to this list in the coming months. If you're a resident of any of these states, please contact your HSUS state director in those states to get involved. You can find them all at humanesociety.org slash state directors. So back to you, Camilla. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> In addition to all of those statewide bans, resolutions are another powerful strategy in our, in our toolkit to uh, end these killing contests. Preceding the state bans in Arizona and New Mexico, residents in several localities helped pass city and county resolutions that condemned wildlife killing contests and called on the state government to take action. These incredible advocates were an inspiration to all of us. The resolutions send a, send a strong message that the, the general public will no longer tolerate these events. Since then, resolutions have been passed in Minnesota, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Wisconsin. You can contact us for sample resolution language if you would like to approach your local government about doing its own resolution. And we're excited to share that federal legislation will soon be introduced to ban killing contests on federal public lands. We are working with a coalition of uh, members of Congress and organizations to put together language and we're hopeful uh, very soon we will be introducing this bill and we encourage you to join our e-teams and sign up for action alerts to track the progress of this bill and also uh, get involved in pushing your members of Congress to support and co-sponsor it. Finally, we want to add that it's so important for all of us to become active participants in our state wildlife agency commissions. While wildlife management has shifted in recent decades, state wildlife agencies continue to manage native carnivores almost entirely for their use to humans as commodities and as pests that need to be eradicated. And state wildlife commissions, which approve the policies are dominated by hunting, trapping, and ranching interests that are appointed by the state governor. This is despite the fact that research has found that public attitudes toward native carnivores like wolves, coyotes, and others are improving dramatically, and they want to see them protected now more than ever before. So it's vitally important that state commissions and agencies regularly hear from you as a constituent. Your state's wild animals do not belong only to those who want to hunt and trap them. They belong ultimately to everyone. And also as our state commissions, as wildlife stewards, they essentially have to listen to everyone in the state, not just to those who ultimately want to hunt and trap our wild animals. So we strongly believe that just like dog fighting and cock fighting that we have collectively banned as a nation, that was generally a state by state effort, we can do the same with wildlife killing contests. We very much believe that this is an achievable goal, but I will say Jill and I have experience in Betsy getting everyone involved, getting everyone behind this very simple mission to ban this practice. And for us, we believe that killing contests are really symptomatic of a much broader issue of wildlife mismanagement in this country. So we hope that you'll get involved, sign up for our E-teams and uh, engage in any way that you can from writing to speaking out. There are many different ways that you can get involved. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Jill and Betsy. Hi everyone, good afternoon, Camilla and Jill and Marissa. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Doing good. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful to have you and good to see you. Um, so, wow, a lot. Uh, definitely a lot of comments coming in. First, I would just like to say, and I think I'm speaking for just about everyone I've ever met and who's ever met both of you, what a undertaking to have to deal um, with something so horrible on a daily basis, and yet you continue to fight the fight and be a voice against something that, you know, 99% of us can't even believe exist. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for that. I uh, really admire the both of you and all the work that you do. So 
Thank you. Uh, and I want to introduce Marissa real quickly. She is an Apex Protection Project volunteer, and she'll be doing the interpreting for the hearing impaired today. So thank you, Marissa. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in, but I thought actually we would start uh, with you, Camilla, talking a little bit about the coalition and how people can get involved. Um, our social media person is posting all the links that you provided to us, but if there's an immediate action or anything that anyone can do right now with the coalition, please let us know. Absolutely. Um, so Jill and I co-founded this coalition back in uh, 2018, and we now have more than 50 national and state organizations that are part of it that uh, represent both animal protection and uh, environmental conservation. And we continue to bring in new members almost on a weekly basis. Um, we do have an application on the web page um, and you can find the web page by going to Project Coyote uh, homepage and you'll see a um, link there to take you to the coalition site. And yeah, in terms of actions right now, I mean, we have several states looking ahead in 2021 that coalition members will be targeting, um, including New York, New Jersey, Oregon, Maryland, New Hampshire. Um, Jill can let me know if I missed any states there. Uh, we're also examining Nevada and, and a few other places. Um, and then we're hoping to introduce legislation, uh, federal legislation that would target killing contests on public lands, such as Bureau of Land Management lands and Forest Service lands. So once that's introduced, that will be an opportunity for everyone to uh, wage in and um, and get involved. So I would say keep an eye out on the web page and um, join all of our action alert uh, e-teams and we'll keep you posted about different state efforts and lots of ways to get involved. Absolutely, great. Um, Jill, lots of headway with different states. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, I know when I came on board, I think only one state, <laughs> California, had uh, banned the killing contest. What states, do you have any predictions on who might be up next and how we could possibly, I know Camilla just gave us ideas on how we could rally the troops, but any other things that people can do if they want to start a movement right now in their state? Absolutely. You can go to the uh, coalition website, which is projectcoyote.org slash endkillingcontest, and there you'll find a link to a toolkit that we've created uh, from the, uh, with the Humane Society of the United States where you that will help you start to take action right in your own state so it has uh, lots of uh, resources for doing research on wildlife killing contests and then um, how to take action whether it's writing letters to the editor or op-eds to your local paper or contacting local officials about um, supporting uh, a, a resolution for example that's what uh, this group of amazing advocates in arizona accomplished by just passing resolution after resolution in counties and cities across the state that led to uh, a point when the when the state fish and game commission uh, figured you know we really do need to do something the citizens are really making their voices clear that we need to get rid of these contests in the state so um, check out all of the resources from hsus project coyote and all of our other member organizations on that coalition website uh, and like I said, you can download our toolkit to start uh, taking action right in your own state. Absolutely. I, I think this is one of the most powerful ways people can use their voice is starting by community, community by community, city by city, county by county. And I know we encountered along the way, oh, resolutions are not law. But to your point, Jill, resolutions are the voice of the people. And at a certain point, elected officials, whether your city, county, or state, have to start paying attention. So never underestimate the power of standing at that city council meeting and starting a movement, you know, to ban killing contests. Um, an interesting question just came through. Do you find it equally useful to educate children and adults, or can children have an impact on adults that are currently, you know, participating or support or possibly not aware of these types of things? Well, I, I know Camilla works a lot with, with uh, young people um, in her work, but I'll just add real quickly that we have found with our outreach to, to young people, particularly about wolves, but also other native carnivores like coyotes, that kids already get it. They understand how important these species are to healthy ecosystems. And 
and they also understand their inherent value. Um, and, and by and large, society does not support these types of um, horrible killing contests or trophy hunting of these animals. And uh, the kids understand that. And, and so um, I, I, I think, to answer your question, I think more outreach needs will, would need to go more to adults um, who have the ability to help make policy change. But um, uh, young people really do understand already the importance of these uh, native carnivores like coyotes and wolves and the importance of, of protecting them from cruelty. But I'll, I'll let Camilla jump in there, sorry. <laughs> No, I, I completely agree with Jill that, you know, young people get it. Um, this is a pretty heavy duty issue, um, as we've all seen from HSUS's investigative reports, our film. Um, so it's, you know, it's always a, a difficult issue of um, how much do we show of the, the gore to young people. At the same time, I will share that in the California effort in 2014, leading to our ban, um, we had young kids come and testify before the commissioners and you could just, the silence and the mesmerizing aspect of these young voices and their passion behind it. Um, they had amazing teachers who taught them not only about the horrors of killing contests, but also about the wonders of these apex predators that are so targeted. And so their voices can be incredibly powerful. Um, they also did a lot of artwork and outreach um, through letters and petitions. So we do believe that involving youth in a lot of these campaigns um, can be very powerful. I just think we have to be careful about um, how we reach them. And, and with you know vivid imagery and graphic imagery, I think we have to be very careful there. And what a contrast to those who involve children of that age in these events. Betsy, you just nailed it. I was about to say that, you know, I was just remembering that in Idaho, where wolves were targeted in killing contests, um, they allowed participants as young as 10 years old to be involved. I mean, to go out and kill wolves and coyotes. Just unbelievable that that is legal by our state. So yes, the juxtaposition. Um, and that is even all the more reason why I think we do need to involve youth, but we just need to be very careful and thoughtful as we do that. Yes. No, I'll just add, in, uh, I think we mentioned it in our presentation, there was a contest in Utah that had an age group as young as five years old um, that they were also giving away rifles as prizes too. But we've also seen other contests like the Coyotes for Kids tournament in Illinois, uh, where they specifically targeted or, or had children involved. And then as uh, you might've seen our investigation uh, in Maryland, uh, of a fox killing contest. There were children uh, stepping around the bodies and even helping to carry them in to be uh, counted and weighed for prizes. Yeah, and you know, that really leads to some, uh, you know, some larger topics, which you both know was always my, one was, was the thing that I talked about most is the ethics of all this. And not just the ethics, but what kind of person are we talking about who takes such uh, pleasure, if you will, in senseless killing, in terror, in awful killing, like we're very clear, this is not ethical hunting. I mean, we we don't even call it that. But what kind of person, you know, because there's all these studies that show the FBI and our own Justice Department correlate, you know, uh, very violent people with doing very violent things to animals. And in my world, and I think in the world of most people watching this today, what you describe happens in those killing contests would fit that bill. Same, likewise, why isn't it child abuse to be exposing? You know, why is this okay with, with coyotes, but not, but, you know, if it were a cat or a dog, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the big things that we're trying to point out is that, you know, when you put a dog and a coyote next to each other, a wolf, and you look at genetically how um, similar they are, how we persecute and vilify one and then adore and spend billions of dollars on the other, there's um, a definite cognitive dissonance there. So that is sort of undergirds all of this that we're trying to point out. Um, and in answer to your question, what kind of person, uh, I will share that we have a new film that will be coming out, um, produced by some Nat Geo, National Geographic uh, producers. And they embedded in some contests in Texas. Um, <clears throat> and some of the things that came out of 
this embedding and uh, the experience, I think, will really reveal to the world what kinds of people are attracted to this. And unfortunately, I'd, I'd like to say that it's a tiny little sliver of the populace, but unfortunately, as our coalition does more research, we find that these are happening all over. Um, so I think there's an element here that we need to look at a little bit more in terms of the psychology of what attracts people to this kind of wanton waste and mass killing and start to get at that. And that again, goes back to the youth. Um, I think it's just so critical. Project Coyote has a Keeping It Wild Youth Education and Outreach Program. And we do think reaching young people, particularly in rural areas where a lot of these killing contests emanate from um, is absolutely critical. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add real, uh, real quick, um, as you mentioned earlier, um, fortunately for this, more and more ethical hunters and wildlife management professionals and commissions and agencies are also speaking out uh, about this. And that's why they are banning them because uh, in, in, in remarkably similar statements in Arizona and Massachusetts and Colorado, and just a couple of months ago in Washington state, they all said that public outrage over these contests is, is threatening the very future of hunting itself because the hunters are a very small minority uh, of, of America's population. And um, people are, are speaking up more and more that um, this is just not acceptable. Unfortunately, the uh, hunters themselves and the agencies that regulate them are also speaking up. It was, it was quite a remarkable uh, debate to watch most recently in the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission, where uh, several commissioners spoke up and said, if, if we don't start taking up these, these issues of, of ethics in hunting, who else will? And, and they, they agreed, we need to do it. We Absolutely. need to get rid of these contests. You know, we did post the link in the comments, but that article in the Mountain Journal, I would encourage everyone to read. It is riveting and uh, gave me a little bit of hope, but because, uh, you know, this came out quite some time ago and a lot has shifted, you know, the momentum has shifted since then. It's a fantastic article. I highly recommend it to everyone. Um, you know, I don't even know the answer to this question. We we're talking about killing contests here in the U.S., but are you guys... Uh, working with anyone outside the U.S.? I mean, I know, Jill, you, you're, there's an international arm to HSUS, but is the, is the coalition or anything like that doing anything internationally? You can pipe um, in. <laughs> yeah. no, I was just going to say, we are Humane Society International Canada uh, is working with uh, advocates in British Columbia to, uh, to take on wildlife killing contests in that province. But that's, uh, that's all I know, but Camilla. Might know more. Yeah, well, I'll just say that our, our certainly the coalition is focused in the U.S. Um, <laughs> we want to see what we can do here. And, and ultimately, we do believe that like dog fighting and cock fighting, which our movement has banned and was a state by state effort. <clears throat> we do believe that this is a winnable campaign and we can ban it in every state. Um, that said, it does take place, as, as uh, Jill mentioned, in B.C. and other provinces. Um, we too are working, we have a couple of science advisory board members in BC and are looking at that. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can ex extend our tentacles up there because they do, um, they do happen in uh, the Canadian provinces. Great. Um, you know, I want to jump back to the U.S. for a second because we have a, a comment and a question from Casey York, who you guys probably know. In 2019, the Montana legislator, there were two related bills, one to end killing contests for coyotes and fox, the other to end legalized running over of coyotes, which we all know is called yote whacking. Both bills died in committee. Only 13 people showed up to testify and they were outnumbered by the predator haters, her, her words. How do you get more people to show up and testify to show just how much this matters to people, to Montanans? Note in Montana, these predators, coyotes, are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Livestock. Yeah, that was Senator Mike Phillips, who um, took it upon himself to introduce those two bills. And he knew going in that it was going to be a rough road. Um, Montana is very challenging on the predator front. 
And in terms of the question about how do we get people to show up, I will point to both Washington and Colorado, which as Jill mentioned, were the most recent two states to pass uh, rules banning this practice. And the virtual world um, is interesting in terms of how we lobby and how we get people to show up. But I will share that we had a lot of people show up for both of those meetings virtually. Um, and most recently in Maine, that is also considering a ban on killing contests. Every single one of the people who testified there with the exception of one spoke in favor of banning killing contests. And so I do think the virtual world is actually helping us in some ways for getting more people to show up. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's up to a lot of us on the coalition, the different organizations to alert our supporters. And that's part of why we formed this coalition so that we can work cohesively together and make sure that everyone is hearing about these things. So I think we will see a, a shift as we have seen with Colorado and Washington around that. And, and I'll just add, uh, sadly, Mike, Phillips is no longer uh, a legislator in, in Montana. Um, he, he's working on other things, uh, most recently with the Colorado uh, ballot measure to reintroduce wolves. Um, so advocates in that state, um, they, I know it's an uphill climb, but um, would need to find new uh, legislators willing to, to take this issue on. Uh, there was a bill also in Wyoming uh, by uh, Representative Mike Yin, uh, that also didn't get very far. But I mean, that's Wyoming is kind of the ground zero of, of that horrible practice of coyote whacking, they call it. Um, but I thought it was very encouraging that that he tried and and may try again if enough advocates, you know, um, show support and, and help him help him try that again. That's and that, you know, as Jill was mentioning when you asked about what can people do i mean it's amazing sometimes when you just contact your legislator or your commissioner and you express interest in this and you buttress it with information that we have on our coalition website we have science sign on letters with more than 70 scientists who have signed on to say these killing contests um, are not wildlife management so arming yourself with that information using the hsus toolkit and then reaching out to your legislators or your commissioners, it's amazing sometimes that they don't even know this is happening. So that's why we encourage people just, you don't need a state bill or a proposed rule to actually just take proactive action. And sometimes you reach someone like Mike Phillips who says, oh, wow, okay, I wanna sponsor a bill. And, and I would just like to add to that, be sure to reach out to everyone. Don't reach out to someone because you think their political affiliation may not be on the same side as your cause, right? We learned that that was a very big lesson we learned here. No, it wasn't a lesson we learned. It was something that we, you know, found out was a huge supporter that both sides of the aisle, you know, opposed killing contests. So I, I encourage everyone not to bring politics into advocacy. You never know who your friends are. So yeah. um, one last question, because you did talk about reaching out to your legislators. So places like Montana, anything, any of us outside of Montana I'm just using that as an example. Are they even going to listen to us if we write nice letters or talk to the commission or send letters to the editor? Or does it have to be a Montana effort? I would say in general, and I'll just give, go back to Maine as an example. And I grew up in Maine, so I know Maine politics and that if you're an outsider, it's not viewed um, very favorably. So that's why we really try in these efforts to get our state um, constituents to, to weigh in. Um, that's not always across the board. I mean, for example, in our California effort, um, they have to, our, our commission has to consider letters from outside. Um, now, the weight that they give, I think um, definitely more for Californians, but so it does vary in terms of states um, actually having to consider outside uh, input, but I would say in general, one of the reasons why groups like HSUS and Project Coyote target our in-state people is because we know that in, in general policymakers are going to listen to them more. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we are actually have gone over a few minutes because, I mean, I know everyone could talk to you guys all day long. Um, and please know we're all behind you. Um, while you fight something so horrific. Again, you can't even believe they exist. Just about everyone says so. Um, so thank you very much. We've dropped all the links into the comments. Hopefully you'll get lots of signups from people with 
willing to join the coalition and, and start to speak up and attend these meetings and help end these killing contests. So thank you, Jill. Thank you, Camilla. We'll see thank you both. You. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.